There he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scales. Weight, 239 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. Here's the fat man in Murder Through a Crystal. Casman Road is one of those neat little suburban streets where the bungalows don't quite look exactly alike. It was just before midnight when my car stopped in front of number 614. The street was as quiet and peaceful as a country school in July. And most of the bungalows were dark. But number 614 wasn't dark. A light blazed in the living room. Through the window, I could see a black-haired man, big enough to wear one of my suits, walking nervously back and forth, puffing on a cigarette. I looked the place over carefully. Dainty colored curtains made the windows into valentines, and the furniture looked delicate and neat. A bowl of fresh flowers stood on a table near the window. The black-haired man was still pacing as I walked up on the porch. But he stopped abruptly when he heard my steps. And I got a good look at him through the window. His frightened eyes stared toward the door as he ground out the cigarette. He stood there long enough for me to see that he looked 30, but was probably a good deal older. When I hit the knocker, he jumped. Then headed for the door. Who's there? The fat man, Brad Runyon. Oh, Come in. I I wasn't sure who it was. Expecting somebody else? No, I'm not expecting anyone but you. I'm nervous, I guess. Why? Well, after all, I don't do this sort of thing every night. Just what sort of thing are we doing, Frazier? You weren't too specific over the telephone. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Runyon. I couldn't say too much on the phone. You're not talking on a phone now. What time is it? Five minutes to twelve. At 12.30, I'm going to meet some men. I want you to go with me. Why do you need me? Well, I'm not sure about these men. I don't trust them, and I might need help. Who are the men? I don't know. Why are you meeting them? To to give them some money. Blackmail? No, not exactly. I, I don't know whether you've heard about it, but during the last three or four months, it seems a gang of thieves have developed a new and apparently very safe racket. Somebody comes up with a new racket every day. Which one has you cornered? Well, uh, I'm not exactly involved. I'm merely acting as an agent for a friend. These thieves pick out some prominent person, usually a woman. Uh, They watch her closely, learn her habits, and try to find out what valuable jewelry she may have. They then wait for an opportune time and hold her up. Exactly. They usually steal something of great value that would be difficult to peddle. So they hold it for ransom. Is that the idea? Uh, More or less. They contact the victim and offer to sell it back for a sum much less than the actual value of the jewels. A nice, clean little racket. Yes. And this friend of yours is, of course, a woman. Of course. Married. Naturally. But you're not married, and you were with her when she was held up. Now, look here, Runyon. I'm hiring you to accompany me in case there's any trouble, and I don't intend to... Skip it. I'm not interested in your private life. I just want the facts. You were with her, weren't you? Yes. Her husband has a terrible temper, and he doesn't know the bracelet is gone yet. If he should find out... Your name would be much. I'm thinking of the woman. Sure, sure. So it was a bracelet. Yes, a diamond bracelet worth about uh, $40,000. What are they asking? $5,000. Did she give you the money? I have it here in my pocket. Where are you supposed to meet these guys? Well, it's about a 15-minute drive from here out in the country. We'd better get started. Do you have a gun? Yeah. Why? I don't want any trouble, any shooting. I... I'd prefer it if you'd empty your gun. If they try anything, when I give them the money, you can step out with the gun and frighten them away. (laughs) They don't sound like the kind of boys who frighten easy. And you don't look like a wife chaser to me. I think I'll keep the bullets in. I 
I don't understand. It may just be a coincidence, but we might look a little too much alike standing still in the dark. You, you better stop here. Turn off the lights. Nice lonesome spot. I'm to meet them just this side of the old covered bridge over Russ Creek. It's about 200 yards down that little dirt road, leading off from our right up ahead. Can you see it? I think so. I'll walk on down there. Wait about a minute and then follow me, but don't make any noise. Keep a good distance back, but watch me. If they start anything, then you can do whatever you think best. I've got a better plan. What? First... Tell me the name of this friend of yours. I can't do that. Anything you tell me is confidential. I'd lose my license if I tried any funny business. Now, what's her name? I don't see what difference it makes. It might make a big difference. Very well. Her name is Mrs. David Creel. That's better. Now, listen to me. I don't like this job, and I don't like your story. You're going to sit here in this car while I take a look at that bridge. But they might hear you. Let me worry about that. If you're on the level, a little scouting won't do any harm. I'll be back in about five minutes. Get down in the back of my car so nobody passing can see you. All right, but be careful. That's just exactly what I'm doing. The moon ducked behind a cloud as I moved off into the shadows, got contrary and popped out again just as I reached the little dirt road. I stopped by a tree and glanced back car looked empty. For five seconds, I stood under the tree listening. Only the sound of crickets broke the silence. I felt uneasy and I didn't know why. There was something wrong with the picture, something about the big guy huddled on the floor of the car that I didn't like. Pulling the pistol from my hip pocket, I headed for the covered bridge, taking my time and hugging the shadows under the overhanging trees. The bridge loomed ahead like a barn in the middle of the road. Ten yards from the bridge, the chirping of the cricket suddenly stopped. I stopped and held my breath. Nothing for ten seconds, and then they started again. I walked onto the bridge and across to the other side. A black convertible with the top down was half hidden in the trees just off the road. It was empty. But the driver's license in the pocket was made out to David Creel. I was halfway back up the little dirt road when I heard somebody trying to get through the brush. Slipping the safety on my gun, I waited behind a bush. Watch your hurry, Mr. Creel. Hmm? Oh, who, who are you? Little boy blue. And this is no horn in my hand. It's a loaded forty-five. What do you want? How did you know who I was? You ought to carry your driver's license in your wallet. My driver's license? But... My license... It's in the pocket of your car. Oh, yes. Yes, my car. Let's take a walk, Creel. Uh, first, tell me who you are. I'm a private detective. A detective? He's waiting for you in my car. He? My client. The guy you're looking for. He was afraid of you, so he hired me to come along and hold his hand. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Move along. He's about 50 yards down the road. You don't look like a mob to me. Listen to me. I don't know who you are or what you're talking about. Then what are you prowling around the woods this hour of the night for? That's my business. Was he blackmailing you or were you blackmailing him? There's been some mistake. Yeah. There's my car up ahead. He's waiting inside. <laughs> On the floor. He's scared silly. And I thought a mob was gunning for him. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's this about a, a mob? That's his story. I guess he felt foolish being afraid of you. No. No, I think you're wrong. Uh, who is he? Who's waiting in that car? Frazier. Who else? Frazier? Carl Frazier? Yeah. Wasn't he the guy you were expecting? No. I wasn't expecting anybody. Then what were you doing here? I, uh, I... I followed someone here tonight. Who? My wife, Emily. What was she doing here? I, I don't know. I suspected she'd been seeing this Frazier. 
Tonight, she took my car. I had a taxi waiting on the corner. I followed her out here to the other side of the bridge. Then you didn't drive your own car here? No. I left the taxi about three or four hundred yards back, uh, from where she parked back there in the trees. I tried to follow her in the woods, but I must have lost her. Come on. I think we'll have a talk with Frazier. Uh, what was all that about blackmail? I don't know yet. It's Runyon, Frazier. Get out and come out here. It's okay, Frazier. There's nothing to be afraid of. He must have left the car. Emily must have been the person he was meeting. I don't know who he was meeting, Creel. But whoever it was didn't like him much. Hmm? How, how do you know? They stuck a knife in the back of his neck. <laughs> No fingerprints on the knife, Mac. Nah. What did you find on Frazier's body? Ah, the usual stuff. Watch, cigarettes, wallet. What was in the wallet? Nine dollars in cash, some stamps, a tailor's receipt for a suit of clothes. Nothing that means anything. Frazier told me he was carrying five thousand dollars in cash. Hey, that might make a difference. Did you see the doll? No, but I think he had the cash, or... Something that was worth that much or more. What do you mean? I don't know, Mac. What about Mrs. Creel? Well, we haven't found her yet. We found Creel's car, though. It was parked in an alley over near Colbert Street. Looks like she's our baby. Maybe, but don't discount Creel. If Frazee was playing around with his wife, Creel had a swell motive, and he had the opportunity. On the other hand, you said yourself this Frazier wasn't exactly a lady chaser. I can't imagine any dame going for it. That's the part that doesn't fit, unless he was blackmailing her. But I think there's something else in this, Mac, something that hasn't shown yet. Eh, I think it's the woman, Brad. When we get her... I'll I'll call you later, Mac. I got a visitor. Okay. I'm looking for Mr. Runyon. Your search is ended. Have a seat. Thank you. I'm pretty busy right now. What did you want to see me about? You're not too busy to make $5,000, are you? Murder is a very serious crime, Mrs. Creel. You knew me. Kublan was right. Kublan? He's a famous mystic, a great man. And you go to this Kublan for advice? Yes. He said you'd give me the letter back for $5,000. You will, won't you? Maybe. I have the money here in my purse. I promise the police will never know. Never know what, Mrs. Creel? That you murdered Carl Frazier last night. Oh, you needn't pretend, Mr. Runyon. The letter was not on Carl's body last night. Then you were the one he had a date with? Yes. He was to bring the letter and I... The letter? Of course. Oh, it was foolish of me, I know, but I thought I loved him. Then he wouldn't see me. I became frantic. I wrote this letter and told him I loved him and how much he meant to me. Please give it back to me. I'll give you the $5,000 gladly, and I'll forget that I, I've i ever seen you. It's not as simple as that, Mrs. Creel. But why not? If you took the letter... I and... didn't take any letter, and I didn't kill Frazier. He told me a bracelet had been stolen from you by a gang of hold-up men. He said he was buying it back for you. A hold-up and a bracelet? There wasn't any hold-up. I lost nothing. You didn't give Frazier $5,000 to buy back a stolen bracelet for you? No. No, of course not. Don't you see, he was blackmailing me for the letter I'd written. He was going to sell the letter to me last night. Don't you understand? Yeah, I think I do understand. What do you mean? Frazier hired me to go with him last night because he was afraid the person he had a date with was going to kill him. Mrs. Creel, you killed Carl Frazier last night. I'm desperate, Mr. Runyon. I want that letter, and I intend to get it. The gun won't help you. I want that letter. Sorry, I don't have it. Maybe your husband got it. David? Uh Uh-huh. He was there last night, too. He followed you in a taxi. No. No, he couldn't have. Well, that's impossible. Don't move, Mr. Runyon. And don't 
try to follow me. I wouldn't think of it, Mrs. Creel. see Kublin. Who is calling, please? Mr. Shanks. Look, I called about an hour ago. Oh, yes, yes, of course, Mr. Shanks. Come in. His Excellency will see you at once. Good. Would you just follow me? Uh, since this is your first visit, Mr. Shanks, I feel I must warn you of our rules. Rules? Under no circumstances must you speak while His Excellency is concentrating. Uh, second, we prefer as little publicity as possible. I'm sure you understand. I think I do. Third, it is customary to pay in advance for the reading. So, if you please, uh, ten dollars. Here you are. Ah, thank you so much. In here. Mr. Shanks is here, Your Excellency. I am ready. Come in, sir. That will be all, Mother. Please be seated in the chair across the table from me. Is there any particular thing you want to know? Perhaps you have lost something, Mr. Shanks. It's possible. You're the fortune teller. Suppose you get out your crystal ball and tell me. We have no place here for skeptics. I've paid my ten dollars. Very well. Mr. Runyon. You didn't learn that from the crystal ball. <laughs> Why did you come here, Mr. Runyon? There was a murder last night. Really? And what might that have to do with me? I don't know. But when I talked it over with my crystal ball, your name came up in the conversation. I'm afraid I do not follow you. I didn't think you would, Kublan. I'm talking about Mrs. David Creel. 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 Look in the crystal ball. Maybe that will help your memory. Yes, I think I do remember, Mrs. Creel. It seems she lost a letter. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Now I remember. A rather good-looking woman. Some people might think so. She has been to me several times for readings. She wasn't here this morning by any chance. This morning? Oh, no, she has not been in for some time. I remember the lost letter now. It seems it was rather important. She wanted to know where it was. And you told her? Mr. Ranyan, whether or not you believe in extrasensory powers is no concern of mine. There are a number of people who attribute such powers to me. And there are a number of doctors who tell rich women they're sick if the rich women want to be told that. Naturally, a man must make a living. Oh, call me a quack if you wish. I do nothing outside the law. No one is forced to come to me or to believe what I foresee. And what did you foresee about this lost letter of Mrs. Creel's? Didn't you have the lost letter, Mr. Ranyan? No. I think you did, Mr. Ranyan. And I think you still have it. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, Mother. You are stronger than you look. Quickly, search him. All right, Kelly, break it down. Okay, Lieutenant. Drop that knife. Hey, Brad. Brad, what in the oh, name of... Oh, Mac. Brad, that knife, did you kill him? No, Mac, I didn't do it. At least I don't think I did. Who is it? A phony fortune teller named Kublan. What happened to you? Somebody slugged me from behind about four or five hours ago. I don't remember anything else. I woke up just a second ago. This knife was in my hand. Somebody's idea of a joke, I guess. Some joke? Yeah. How did you get in on the party? Uh, a phone call tipped us that there'd been a murder at the fortune tellers. Where do you fit in, Brad? Mrs. Creel was a patient or a patrol of this guy, Kublin. He sent her to me to get a letter that Frazier was blackmailing her with. You? But I don't get it. 
I think I'm beginning to. Did the same person that killed Fraser last night kill the Swami? I'm not sure. I think Fraser and this guy Kublin were working a racket together. Blackmail, huh? Yeah, it's an old racket. They look for silly women. The fortune teller gives her the works, gets her confidence by telling her a few obvious things. Then he tells her some dark man is coming into her life. We've seen it hundreds of times. Then Frazier pops up and the game is on. Yeah, I get it. In this case, it was a love letter she wrote to Frazier, probably at Kublin's directions. After that, they ring her dry. The fortune teller pretends to help her, but of course he only makes it tougher for her. Then she must have gotten wise to him and knocked her both off. Maybe. But it could also be her husband. And there's something else. What? This guy Kublin had an assistant, a tall, dark, oriental-looking babe named Marver. It could be any one of the three. Let's take a ride, Mac. Whoever killed Frazier and Kublan did it to get the blackmail letter, but I don't think they got it. I think the letter is still somewhere in that house. And unless I miss my guess, the murderer probably thinks so, too. Got your gun, Mac. The door's unlocked. Check. I don't think anybody's here now. Let's find a light. Yeah, here's a switch. Hey, look at this place. Yeah. Looks like a cyclone hit. Must have been the murderer, all right. Whoever it was was in an awful hurry. I wonder if they found the letter. I don't think so, Mac. Why not? First, they were in too much of a hurry. And second, don't you notice anything peculiar in this room, Mac? Mm, no, I don't think so. Nothing except the room's been torn apart. I don't mean that. I mean something unusual, something that isn't right. Mm, no. What are you driving at? That bowl of flowers on the table by the window. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised it wasn't broken. Look at the flowers, Mac. Well, tulips, aren't they? Yeah. When I was here last night, I noticed them. I thought at the time it was funny for a man to have fresh flowers in his house, even a man like Frazier. But, of course, last night the tulips were fresh, so they all looked alive. But now they're all wilted, except one. You mean, you mean that one is an artificial flower? That's right, Mac. A good one, too. Now then. Hey. In the stem. Uh-huh. It's hollow. Here, let's see now. It's the letter, all right, Mac, and it's a little beauty. No wonder it was valuable. How very clever of you, gentlemen. Hello, Marver. The letter, please. Throw it on the floor. And put your hands well above your head. Okay, there you are. Put the gun down. You can't get away with this. Well, perhaps you are right. However, they have not got me yet. And you will not be able to hit them. Well, then, would you satisfy a condemned man's curiosity? Did you kill Kublan? <laughs> Why, yes. Yes, I killed Kublan. I killed him because the fool was going to try and pin Frazier's murder on me. You didn't kill Frazier? No, no. Kublan killed him. Why? He was a fool, too. A greedy fool. He was holding out on us. Walk over to the wall and face it. Killing us won't help you. Do as I say. Okay. Okay. I see where you fit. You were going to use the letter for your own little blackmail, huh? <laughs> Very clever. Is there anything else you would like to know before you die? Yeah. Why do you want the letter now? Well, it uh, happens to be rather valuable, Mr. Runyon. Sure. As long as she was alive, you could blackmail her. But now she's dead, dead? I... Dead? What are you saying? Who is dead? Why, Mrs. Creel, of course. You lying. Lying? You killed her yourself, didn't you? She is not dead. She can't be dead. Hey, wait a minute. Mac, Mac, we're wrong. Huh? What a couple of saps we are. Marva really doesn't know about Mrs. Creel. What are you talking about? Don't you see, Mac? It must have been her husband. He killed her tonight because of Kublan and the letter. Don't you get it? Yeah. Yeah, I get it. It all fits. 
This babe didn't kill Mrs. Creel. She'd never kill the goose that laid her golden eggs. That's why she still wants the letter. <laughs> the joke's on you, honey. Are you telling the truth? Is Mrs. Creel really dead? Call the police if you don't believe me. Well, everything's clear now. Let's get on with the shooting. Or maybe you'd like to make a deal with us. A deal? What sort of a deal? I'm not quite ready for the next world yet, and I don't think Lieutenant Mackenzie is either. You turn around, please. Speak quickly. Okay. Now keep your hands up. Now then, this deal. If Creel killed his wife instead of you, we've got him cold. So? I do not follow you. He could just as easily have killed Kublin, too. Oh, I think I see what you mean. Then if I let you go, you will... Sure. If Creel's going up for one murder, he might as well go for two. And let her off? Nothing doing. Go ahead and shoot. Don't be a sap, Mac. I won't do it, Brad, and I won't let you either. You can't stop me, Mac. It would be your word against mine. Creel killed Coopland, didn't he, beautiful? Well, yes, yes. And as for this stupid Mackenzie, I should kill him anyway. It would be better. Maybe it would. Go ahead. But, Brad, you must be not... Keep quiet, you fool. Now, now we will see how this gun feels against your head. <coughs> oh, you... Let go of my arm. Let's see how the gun feels in my hand. No, no, you... Grab her back, okay? Go. There. Go, you... Yeah, nice work, Brad. Boy, you had me plenty worried there for a minute. Yeah. Now you can worry, baby. Get the cuffs on her, Mac. Right. Hey, but Brad, how did you know that Mrs. Creel was dead? We didn't... She's fall. not dead, Mac. Then, then you were lying. Save it, baby, save it. You know, I'm surprised at you. A big-time fortune teller like you should have been through that. The trouble with you is you don't consult your own crystal ball. If you did, you'd see that murder always puts you behind the eight ball. and getting into trouble and getting out of it. But at the same time, I generally manage to get some other people in and out of trouble, too. Be seeing you again. So long. Mm -hmm.